Hey guys, Montel here, and welcome to this edition of Free Thinking with Montel. Utilizing artistic means to redefine one's own image dates back thousands of years. Participatory photography emerged in 1992 when a group of American women providing agriculture and medical aid in China found that when local farmers were equipped with cameras and trained to document their own lives, the photography, the photography elicited a new visual narrative and shattered stereotypes. I guess today, is an award-winning filmmaker and editor of Project Lives and in a whole new way, undoing mass incarceration by a path untraveled. Both projects are participatory photography books and documentaries on the related subject matter. Jonathan Fisher, thank you so much for being a part of Free Thinking with Montel today, sir. Thank you so much for having me, Montel. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely, sir. It's so good to have you. Look, tell me a little bit about your background before you got involved in these projects. Well, okay, I'm New York City, born and bred, born in 1950. Uh, when I grew up in the 50s, my you know, I lived in the Bronx. My hero was number seven, Mickey Mantle. Um, in 1960, Robert Moses uh, shoved the Cross Bronx Expressway through our neighborhood, so our family had to relocate out to Queens. And so I became a Mets fan and a fan of Tom Seaver instead of Mickey Mantle. That was the big change. Um, I went off to college in Binghamton, New York, and then spent uh, seven or eight months on the hippie trail to the east. Um, and then I wound up getting a master's in transportation out at Northwestern University in Chicago. I love the subway in New York City. And I was one of those brats who rushed to the front car, rushed to the window uh, uh, in, in the front of the front car and shoved everybody else out of the way. Just wow. so that was you know, that was my life. So. I pursued that uh, that interest, uh, got the master's in transportation, and and then returned to New York City. And I worked for the New York City subway system, you know, living the dream for 26 years before I took uh, early retirement in 2000, and then started doing a bunch of other you know gigs for various agencies um, and and uh, businesses. Uh, my buddy at the Transit Authority, George Carano. He also uh, left the Transit Authority, uh, retired in 1999, and he devoted his life to his visual, uh, to his interest, long lifetime interest in, in uh, the visual arts. And that led him by 2010 to found the nonprofit Seeing for Ourselves, whose mission was equipping and training marginalized people to take control of their own, pub of their own public narrative by documenting their lives photographically. And then you joined this organization. What, I joined the nonprofit, yes, in 2010. So that's how I wound up in this area. In 2010, okay. And then, you know, again, tell us again, what is the, the mission of the organization? It's equipping and training marginalized people to take control of their own public narrative, to, to counter negative stereotypes that are pervasive in the, in the media. And this, for example, this negatively, such stereotypes <laughs> really impacted public housing residents of New York City. You know, for the last generation, the media had been treating public housing as just uh, cesspools of crime and disrepair. And that kind of led the government to back away from its funding, which led to even more crime and disrepair, which led to even worse media coverage. You know, it was this vicious cycle that went on and on and on. Um, yeah, well, explain what participatory photography is and why it's so effective. Okay, so what, what it is, it's it's turning over to the camera to those usually on the other side of the lens. You know, and this, you mentioned the, the, uh, the origins of this practice in 1992. Back then it was fairly revolutionary because uh, it was the age before, the era before smartphones and only the well-to-do really had access to high-end photography training and equipment. Uh, but even now, as we point out in the film, even in the Instagram era, many marginalized people uh, find their li public lives defined by powers who are very foreign to themselves, you know. So it would, you know, the public housing residents had their public image defined by the tabloids in New York City in a very negative way, and that impacted both their own lives and condition the conditions in which they lived. So um, our first uh, practice was at the housing projects in New York City. And what, do you, what do you, and what do you do? You you give residents of those those projects cameras. Yes, so yes, we get, we get, Yeah, in in project in, in that project, um, uh, we we uh, what we do is we we uh, conduct a twelve week course 
a college level course in the art of visual storytelling and then amplify the photographs that come out of it. That's basically what we do. So in the housing projects where we started the practice in, 20, in 2010, um, we conducted classes of those re of residents who lived in the housing projects. And we conducted classes maybe in about 15 housing projects in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Brooklyn between 2010 and 2013. We wound up collecting the best photographs and combined it with a backstory about public housing, basically, you know, which led, you know, the, which helped to amplify the power of all their photographs. And that, uh, that collection and that backstory wound up in the book Project Lives, which was published by Powerhouse in 2015. Got a lot of notice. Um, more to the point, um, it act, the new image that was put in front of tens of millions of eyeballs through media replica, replication of the imagery helped New York City and New York State come back to the funding table and start supporting public local public public housing again. And when New York City saw that this 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 actually worked, that participatory photography can have an impact, they said. Okay, you guys, you proved your concept in the housing projects. Can you please now take your practice downtown to 33 Beaver Street, which is where the New York City Department of Probation is headquartered, because we think uh, that's another marginalized population that could also benefit from your practice. And this is what really the, the nature of your new book, documentary, The Whole New Way, Undoing Mass Incarceration by a path untraveled. Explain that. That's right. That's right. Because we wound up and we, you know, we applied for and got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And on that basis, the New York City Department of Probation created a budgeted slot for our photography teacher at the, at the beginning of 2018. And so, you know, even though we had no background in criminal justice, no knowledge of probation whatsoever, um, we found ourselves embedded there and uh, started conducting classes. And what did you what did you learn in this process as as it relates to probation? Well, we we didn't know the first thing about probation. And you know, many Americans, Montel, confuse probation with parole. Probation is jet, jet basically um, an alternative to incarceration. You know, if a, if a judge feels that a per, that a defendant can be safely supervised in the community, uh, he, they could. Uh, put them on probation for a specific term and with, with a specific set of stipulations that they have to obey. Parole, on the other hand, is like early release from incarceration. You know, it's like if you if you've behaved yourself while in prison, uh, then you can get it. You sort of get out of, get out of prison earlier than your the term would normally dictate. While you're on parole, are you on probation, or you are on parole and your probation is something entirely different? Probation and parole. Par probation is the front end of the criminal justice system. Parole is the back end of the criminal justice system. Gotcha. So when looking at probation and and applying these techniques of you know uh, uh, photography to that, what did you learn? We well certainly we learned that this was a marginalized population that did not deserve to be you know treated so negatively in the media, just like public housing residents. I mean, for the last, you know, similar to public housing residents for the last generation, probation and those serving a term of probation had been treating, uh, had been treated by the media in a very negative way. This originated because of the way probation evolved in this country, Montel. You know, it, it actually began in Boston in 1841. It was invented by a bootmaker of all things. Um, and um, for the, it became uh, in, institutionalized in Massachusetts in 1878, and for about a century afterwards, it, it actually continued. It actually fulfilled its original rehabilitative practice. Now, and was there, originally, it was under the guise of, if I don't put you in prison, I might be able to help you get back on a straight and narrow without incarceration. Without incarceration, by supervising you in the community, and there were two elements to that supervision. One was. Um, you could be subject to unannounced home visits uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, you had to report periodically report into a probation officer. Those were the twin elements of, of probation practice, and they are to this day. And the practice was founded as a rehabilitative technique. And as I mentioned, it remains so. It remains so up until the crime wave that began, sort of kicked off in 1972. So with the crime wave, I guess uh, municipalities lean more heavily on incarceration directly and started 
putting probation on the sideline, huh? Well, actually, probation expanded, but it, but, it, did it. but it turned punitive. It completely lost its rehabilitative uh, aim and became, in a way, a staging area for incarceration. There were so many stipulations put on, put on people on probation, and the caseloads grew so enormous that there could be so little help from probation officers that folks on probation wound up pinballing back and forth between incarceration and probation. And, and nobody could see, succeed on probation for very long. And so you know, the, the irony was that it was just then, also as another result of the crime wave, that the media began treating probation as a slap on the wrist, if not a joke. So it's weird that it happened just when it turned punitive, but be it that as it may, that's when the media turned against probation and we're living with its consequences now. Now, many jurisdictions since 1992 have walked, gradually walked back probation practice to its original rehabilitative roots. I don't think any, any jurisdiction more so than New York City, where we were happily embedded. But in many other jurisdictions, like Pennsylvania, for example, it remains like a trap and where people could be violated and sent back to prison if their boss keeps them an extra hour at work, if there's an emerg medical emergency with their child. I mean, for the most natural reasons, they could wind up being reincarcerated. And there's a major reform effort right now going on in Pennsylvania just to change all that. But Pennsylvania is not alone. Many, many jurisdictions are still like that. And we think it's encouraged by the continued negative treatment of probation by the media. And that's what our practice seeks to undo. And, and when you gave out these cameras out, are you doing it now in a video or are you doing it with just still photography? Still, yes, still photography, Montel. We, uh, we gave out uh, Sigma Corporation, made a, a nice donation to us of digital single lens reflex cameras. Uh, our founder and executive director, George Carano, donated his personal dig uh, Canon dig digital single lens reflex ca cameras. And then the, the participants also use their own cell phones. And you know now th these guys these guys take better pictures with their cell phones than than people of our generation took you know thirty years ago. Well, now you know again the project is called a whole new way of undoing or it's hard whole new way of undoing mass incarceration by path untraveled. Is your intention to bring back probation in its original intent or what's that, what's that, the intent? that's exactly right that be that be we by. Um, putting out positive imagery of folks on probation and probation practice, uh, we think the media will, will, will pick up on that imagery, and that in turn will encourage those jur jurisdictions where probation remains punitive to straighten out their act and return to the original rehabilitative aim. And, we and what have you learned in the process? Have you learned, are those other municipalities that are looking at it as a punitive you no know, tool. Are they starting to rethink and readjust their gyro, or are they, you know, full steam ahead? It's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> you know, and actually, um, on August 29th, uh, I was privileged privileged to uh, screen the film uh, for a plenary session of the American Probation and Parole Association, which is the industry group in this country. You know, it represents, I think, as membership of 30,000, it represents the 100,000 probation and parole officers we have in this country. And the, and the screening went very well. And I think people were encouraged by the message of the film to go to return to their agencies and say, there's a whole new way of doing probation. Gotcha. And I mean, your intent isn't at the end of the day to get rid of the probation system. You want to um, uh, expand it so that less people are incarcerated, right? Well, we don't want, you know, we don't want more people on probation. What we think is that many people who are currently incarcerated uh, will do well on probation. By the same token, many people on probation now can be diverted out of the criminal justice system altogether. So, you know, the dynamics, I think, work pretty well. And uh, because probation uh, on a per person basis costs about 20 times less than incarceration, there is a real financial payoff from doing all this. You know, criminal justice reform, we're very you know, fortunate because both the left and the right su support criminal justice reform. The but left, none of them seem to know, but both left and right say they support this, but none of them have come up with a definitive plan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, the left is interested in, you know, is social justice, you know, to give them their due. Folks on the right, 
what appeals to them about criminal justice reform is the possibility of redemption because that plays into their religious outlook. And at the same time, because of the cost savings that I just mentioned, you know, 20 times cheaper probation is on a per per person basis than locking somebody up, conservatives really gravitate towards that uh, financial argument. But then that financial argument, they get they get lobbyists coming in their door talking about more and more for-profit prisons in their area. Yeah, they, yes, more. that's yes, absolutely. But I, I think uh, the Biden administration has helped tamp down that a lot of that uh, private uh, incarceration. You know, they're not giving that many contracts to private companies anymore. You know, but, 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 they, but they still are. You know, I mean, we take a look at the Biden administration. I mean, in one hand, you know, I applaud them, but on the other hand. You know, there are in states, let's say, that have passed, you know, uh, 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 marijuana laws uh, from uh, adult use to uh, medical use. We've seen in some of those states, states the where there supposedly is legal cannabis, incarcerations rates are going up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and, and maybe I don't know who, who uh, you know, probation was, was set for, but I, I'm sure that in some areas of the country, there is a definite racial divide and who gets probation and who goes to jail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most folks on probation are white in this country. And you can Correct. argue that to get probation is actually a good thing compared to the horrible alternative of incarceration. But never the horrible alternative is putting the white person in a prison with a black person. Yeah. I mean, we got, we got to start figuring out yeah. what the horrible really is. How come there are so many black people? That's in prison? right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Right. So tell me a little bit about your previous book uh, or document documentary called Project Lives. Well, actually, Project Lives was the book that we published about the how the our effort in the New York City housing projects. It's okay. in fact, I can here's the copy right here. That's the book. Okay, great, great, great. And if people wanted to get a copy of it, where would they go? Oh, the, on, on Amazon or on uh, ProjectLivesBook.com is our we the website where you could find out all about it. Um, and that, as I mentioned, was published by Powerhouse, an art book publisher in 2015, um, got all kinds of notice, not just nationally and internationally. And that led, the success of that let, you know, led New York City to say, OK, go down and do the same thing at the probation department. And the, probation, the, the, the effort at the probation department led to the book in a whole new way. This also is on Amazon, and, you could, and there's a whole website about it, in a whole new way .com. This, okay. We were trying. We were trying to put put this out in 2020, but then in March the pandemic struck, and it really brought the publishing industry to a halt, thanks to the disruption of global supply chains. So my colleagues in the nonprofit looked at me and they said, "Okay, Jonathan, you are the storyteller of this nonprofit. You better think of something else." So um, I was stuck in my man cave up here in Maine, where I am right now, um, and I started going through the filmed footage of the of this project that had been made available to me as a resource for writing the book. And I began to look at it more closely and I discovered something. You know, photography, some people say it's about pretty pictures. Well, you know, it's not just that. But some people, maybe our nonprofit would have thought photography is a way of undoing a misleading popular na public narrative. Okay, it's that, but it's not just that. What I saw in this film footage was that photography could be the way to change your life. And when I saw that in the footage, I was inspired and I thought other folks would be inspired too. So even though I never made a movie before, I started stitching together that footage with every other kind of related footage I could lay my hands on. Um, I rated our kids college funds, so I and hired an editor. Uh, and then, in, so it became a film that we took a chance on and sent it out onto the film festival circuit in 2021. And lo and behold, it found an audience, not just in America, but all over the world, which was astonishing to us that, you know, that folks uh, from Brazil to Bali, you know, really gravitate towards this tale. And it's because of the charisma of the participants. You know, they're wonderful people. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, their tale is so heartwarming. And I think the audiences all over the world also gravitate to this, to uh, this technique called participatory photography. They find that intriguing. And they give credit to this country, which after all invented probation. You know, and it's a practice that, that since we invented it in 1841 has spread almost all over the world. So everybody, you know, everybody looks to us. Sure. And you know, uh, what other kind of social issues are you looking forward to tackling next? 
Well, we've already started our third project, which is uh, My Climate Future, um, Teenagers Picture Their World to Come. And you, know, you might think, well, are teenagers as marginalized a population as public housing residents or folks on probation? Well, we think so in, in the sense that uh, it's, they haven't been included all that much in the national conversation about climate change. I mean, Greta Thunberg notwithstanding, but she's in her 20s now. And yet they're, you know, teenagers, are, are, they have the most skin in the game. They're the ones who are going to be paying the price for the sins of our generation. So sure. if, if we can get uh, their imagery of, their, of what, how they see their future, get their imagery out in public and have, it, have the same impact as, as uh, we, we're hoping to achieve with our probation project and public housing projects, then great. Then maybe the, the, the needle can move on climate change as well. If more and more people wanted to get involved, where would they go? How do they uh, support the work of, of what you're doing? Well, my email is info at seeingforourselves.org. Uh, the website we have is in a whole new way dot com. Uh, I'm Jonathan Fisher on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you all. I'd love to hear from you all. Um, that would be great. Yeah, anything, anything else you'd like to share, Jonathan, honestly? Oh, it's been a pleasure being here, Montel. I think you know. I think my mother is uh, looking down from heaven on us now because she was a big fan. Of, she was a big fan of you in the in the uh, 1990s, 1980s. Sure, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Well, I, I've been a big fan of yours now, and, and I'm so happy that you did our, uh, our podcast today. So, thank you so much for being a part, and uh, keep us posted on what's going on, anything that's happening, so we can get out and promote for you. Okay. Oh, that would be wonderful, Montel. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And thank you so much for being a part of Free Thinking with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Free Thinking with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear feedback, so please send us your comments.